In the beginning, God created man. Hello. Then he saw that man was lonely, so he created woman. Oh, man. And the two were united in one flesh, and it was good. And then it went very, very bad. This is your this fault. This is your fault. And ever since, man and woman have found all kinds of creative ways to mess up this holy institution. This is your this fault. This is your fault. Join us as we look at marriages throughout the Bible and learn a thing or two about the marriages of today in Once Upon a Marriage. Look at the person beside of you and fist bump them and say, and all those at live spring say, I'm glad you're sitting with me today. Go ahead and do that right now. Yeah. Now, that's good. And if, even if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you don't believe a thing about what I'm going to preach about and anything like that about the Bible and Jesus and all that, I think you're still going to get something out of this message. So sit back and put your guard down and just relax. But if you do make any commitments to Christ, let me know about it. On the bottom of your prayer card, there's a place that says, I have began or I have renewed a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me know about it by checking that box. And uh, at the end of the service, in the auditorium you're in, there's a black box on the wall. And I want you to uh, put that in the black box. If you're watching online, send me an email at pastordale at sanleychapel.com and let me know about any spiritual commitments that you make because it's very important to me. I read every one of those prayer cards. If you don't even, if you don't make a commitment, you just want me to pray for you. Just put your name on there and I'm going to pray for you, okay, this week. So let me know about it so I can pray for you. Hey, I got to make one quick announcement and um, it's a very, very important announcement. Let me tell you a little story and then I'm going to tell you the announcement, okay? This week I had the opportunity uh, to. Um, and I say opportunity, but it's a little bit, I'm saying that a little bit tongue in cheek. It was an opportunity and I'm glad they chose me and allowed me to have a part of this. Uh, but it was not something necessarily that I was looking forward to doing. I had the opportunity to preach the funeral of one of the ladies who's been in our church since the eighties. Um, she won't a part of the charter membership that started, but she was a part of the, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the church foreman and began to serve. Her name was Carla Walsh. And um, she served in so many different ways. In music ministry, she taught kids' church, she taught VBS, she taught Sunday school, she taught everything you could teach uh, in kids. She loved to pour into kids. She washed dishes, she painted rooms. I mean, she did about everything you could do in the church uh, and helped this church get to where it's at today. Now we have um, over 800, 700, 800 people each weekend at our campuses, and we've had uh, uh, you know, last year, 360 people made a commitment to Christ and a lot of people's, uh, been saved. But in those days, it was a small little core group of people. In fact, Stanley Chapel started on Maple Avenue in Sanford in a little house that I don't know, probably a thousand square foot, if that, and there was 17 people that started in a living room. And now look at what's happened. And I think that when she got to heaven, there were a lot of people who's died and gone on and they came up to her in heaven and said, thank you for giving to the Lord. Because she gave her life to something that was bigger than her. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's very important. And I want to encourage you. I want to give you an opportunity to do something very similar. Some of you is not sure what heaven's going to be like for you. And if you've done anything good, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I've often thought most of those 17 people, not all of them, Pastor Earl and Sister Della that started our church are still alive. They usually come to the 945 and 1130 service here at this campus at Stanley Chapel. Uh, but a lot of those people who sat in that room with them have gone on to be with the Lord. And I wonder what it's like now in heaven seeing what their sacrifices produced. So God called us to go to the Spout Springs area, and we started a little ministry there called Life Springs Church, and it's been meeting in a home with about 35 people or so uh, for a year or two, and we feel like it's time to take it to an HNL. Y'all know what that means, right? A holy another level, all right? And God has opened a door, and it looks like we're going to be able to move that ministry into Johnsonville School. Yeah, it's a good wow, wow thing uh, if we can get the support and the help to be able to pull that off. And so I want to invite you to be a part of something. You say, well, Dale, I heard that's a video campus, and I don't know if I would like a video preacher. Then come on Thursday night, and it will be live, and then go and serve on Sunday morning. There's plenty of places to set up that school and turn it into a church or keep kids ministry or park cars or whatever. Uh, I, would, I, would, I think it's a great opportunity, especially if you live in that area. So on, mark your calendar right now. Get out a pen and paper. On February the 21st at 6 o'clock, 
I want to go and meet you at the campus of Life Springs Campus in that house that they're meeting in and tell you about the vision. Actually, I'm going to be there and I'm going to tell you a little bit, but we've asked Pastor Jonathan, our discipleship pastor, he's going to go and lead this ministry. And he'll probably start shortly after uh, around the 21st. And so I would appreciate it if you would come and meet us at 6 o'clock, Pastor Jonathan and I, and just hear the vision. You're making no commitment by being there, but let us tell you what we would like to see happen and then you go home and pray about it and see if God wants you to do that. Everybody got it? If you do, say yes. Now, if you're interested, I want you to write on the back of your prayer card, Life Springs Church. And if that's too much, just put LSC, all right? And we'll know, circle it and highlight it or whatever, write that in, the LSC or Life Springs Church, and we'll know that means we're going to look for you on the 21st. Make sure we got an extra cup of coffee for you. All right, everybody got it? If you're happy, you know it, say Amen. Hey, thank you so much. I hear Rachel in the house. All right. I can't. I hope y'all at Life Springs got somebody amen in like that. All right, here we go. Or wherever. We're in a series called Once Upon a Marriage. We're kicking it off this week, and we're talking about marriage. Now, um, let me tell you where this series came from. There's a guy by the name of Craig Groeschel. He preached this series originally, and we found the series and thought it was so good, we're going to re-preach it here to you. All right? So so these messages are based on his series, and, and, and his church did an outstanding job with the graphics and the video. And, uh, and we want to give kudos to them, and we're going to re-preach that series, and, um, and, and we're excited about it. Now, here's what we're going to do during the series. What we're going to do is we're going to go look at couples in the Bible, and we're going to look at their life, look at the dynamics they had in their marriage, and we're going to glean some things that maybe can speak into our life right now in the 21st century. Some things that are going on in your marriage, some things that are going on in your home, and how do those dynamics impact what's happening for you. So we're going to let those speak into our, our uh, lives. Now, as we get started to kind of get us on the right vein of thought, let me talk to the ladies, all the ladies in the house, wherever, whatever you're at, come on, scream, one, two, three. Woo! All right, let me ask you something, ladies. How many of you dreamed of having the perfect wedding, the perfect husband, the perfect kids? I mean, you started, you even named your kids before you met your husband. Hold your hands up. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. See, you started planning when you were five years old. That's why every now and again I do wedding ceremonies and they're like, we're planning it. He ain't helping me plan this ceremony. I'm like, you know you planned it when you were five years old. If he gave you an idea, you shoot it down. Y'all dress yourself in white, put him in black, because he's just like a candelabra over there. He ain't even got nothing to do with it. He won't even in the vision when you had the vision, right? Like the little boy went to church and the girl was getting married and she, he said, Mama, why she got on white? You know, daughter, why? She said, because the happiest day of her life, she's just radiating. The little boy said, why has he got on black? <laughs> you know? <laughs> all right, all the men in the house right now. Any men in the house, let me hear you say, yeah. Yeah. Now, how many of you dream, when you thought of getting married, you dreamed of one big honeymoon night that lasted for about 20 years and three times on Sunday. Somebody say amen up in the house. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's right. right? I had a buddy of mine that whenever I was growing up, he used to pray, God, don't come back before I get married. <laughs> he was a that after my honeymoon, you can come back, but don't come back till after I've been married, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've probably been there. You probably understand that. And as I, now, let me ask girls and boys together. How many of y'all still dreaming? <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's where we're at right now. So we're talking about that. Ever since we were young, we dream about what a marriage is going to be like. We dream of what it's going to be like one day when we get married. And we kind of have this Hollywood, Cinderella, whatever thing that we're going to find the one right one. Everybody's finding the right one. And once we find that right one, we're going to all live happily ever after. We're going to have the house, the picket fence, the two-car garage, the dog named Rover, and 2.5 kids, and the whole thing. I mean, we're going we're gonna to have it all going on. But the reality of, of, of life, and you know this and I know this, from years of working with couples, not everybody makes it to the happily ever after. So here we go. Would you Life Springs Church social media moment, Stanley Chapel Life, uh, and Life Springs Church social media moment. If you're taking notes, uh, open your bulletin. There's a place there to take notes and fill in a blank, and I encourage you to do so. Happy marriages are about finding the right person and being the right person. Because here's the deal. Some of you keep looking for the right man, the right woman. 
you got to be the right man and the right woman before you can find the right man and the right woman. Let me say, how many of you like to fish? If you like to fish, say yes. You can't catch king mackerel with crappy bait. That's deep right there. All right, here we go. Ready? Now, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a very unusual story about a guy named Jacob who marries actually a couple of women, and he does not appear to have the happily ever after story. And I think one of the reasons why is because of the way he went into this marriage, the frame of reference that he went into. Now, let me give you the backstory. What's going on is Jacob has traveled to the land where his mama was raised at. And he's gone to a well that is there. And when he's at that well, he sees this girl who is drop dead gorgeous. I mean, she is hot. And it is actually his uncle Laban's daughter. Her name is Rachel. And he sees her and she is, I mean, she is, she is a hottie with a body. You know what I'm saying, right? And, and he immediately falls in love with her and, and he thinks he's got to have her. And, and so that's, that's what's going on. Now, if you're doing the math and you're thinking about it, you say, wait a minute, did you say that's his uncle Laban's daughter? That makes his cousin. You're right. But don't judge. They from backwoods. <clears throat> And you from North Carolina, so you liable to have an inbred Jed up in you, you know what I'm saying? And don't even know it. So, so, so don't be judging nobody. Don't be judging nobody. This is a, in fact, that's not even the most bizarre thing about the story. If you read this story, there's a lot more dysfunction than the fact that he's marrying his cousin. And, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to read a little bit into the story. I'm gonna, we're going to have to use our divine imagination. And, and, and you may disagree with some of the interpretations of the story uh, that, that, that we're going to talk about. But nevertheless, the truths of what we're going to going to talk about would be true as well. We're going to need to use our divine imagination, and I mean no injury to the scripture at all when we do that, but we're going to have to read between the lines a little bit and give an opinion on some things that are happening. So here's what we know about Jacob before he ever gets to that well. What we know about Jacob is that he has, he, he's, he's, he's looked at this girl and he says, I got to marry her, but here's what we know about him. We know that he has struggled all of his life with love from his father. He never really fully felt accepted from his father. He never fully felt the love from his father. And that was a real, real, real weird dynamic that went on between him and his dad. And you ought to go read the backstory on that. Now, here's why I mention that, because some of you know exactly how that feels. You grew up in a home where it, dad went around or you never really had a connection with dad. And we live in a society that has what sociologists have called the father wound. And it goes very deep. And you understand the loneliness and the emptiness. And some of you men who just never had that role model, that male role model, and trying to figure it out, and it's hard to talk about because we don't talk about it. He had all that going on. Then to compound that, he had a very, very weird relationship with his mom, and, uh, and that whole relationship seemed really, really dysfunctional, and so that seemed to impact what had gone on in his life. Then to compound all of that at this point in the story where we are right now, um, he had not encountered the unconditional love of God yet. That's going to happen later. He's going to have an experience with God, but at this stage in his life, there was no evidence that he had that deep connection, that deep intimacy, and that deep transformation. Actually, God changes his name later on. He hadn't had that experience yet, and so he, he, he had all that void going on with the parents and all that stuff, and to compound that, he was a very self-centered individual. He stole his brother's birthrights. He tricked his dad into giving him a blessing that he didn't deserve. I mean, he was a manipulator. He was a trickster, and he was a very self-centered kind of person, so you got to understand that. And now he shows up at this well, actually fleeing some trouble he'd gotten himself into is why he showed up there. And he sees this smoking hot girl at the well and he says, I've got to have her. I got to have her. She's got to be my wife. I got to get married to her because maybe if I can get married to her, it can feel the emptiness inside. Maybe if I can get married to her, it will fill this void that is going on inside of my soul. Now, um, many of you have seen people like that. Uh, you all know the girl, or maybe you were the girl, who never really felt complete unless you had a boyfriend. And if you had a boyfriend that left you, you immediately had to find another one because you're just that person. Uh, or, or, maybe, or maybe you're the guy who never feels like you the man unless you got a smoking hot girl on your arm. And, and unless all your buddies are like, man, she's hot. You don't really feel like you have value and you're anything. So if anything ever happens and you've always got to have a girl, a, a really, really good looking girl, the, most, the, the best looking girl you can possibly have, 
Or, or maybe, and, and these are people who just feel like that's the answer. That's the answer for your life. Or maybe you're a, uh, you've all seen it, the middle-aged guy who uh, has this wife who's been faithful to him and kids that's been faithful to him, and then all of a sudden he gets bored at work and he gets to start feeling like he's not so handsome anymore. His hair is falling out while his gut is pushing out. <laughs> Don't laugh. He's got more hair on his back and his ears than he does on his head, you know. And he's not feeling it anymore, and so he finds this, you know, young thing. He decides to trade in his wife of 18 years who's been faithful for a younger model and, you know, a younger, a younger gal. And, and, and she's nothing more than a commodity to him to make him feel good about him. And it's, it's not about love. It's about making him feel good about who he is and what he's got going on. And, and, and this is exactly what happens in our society now, uh, so many times that we look to another person, another relationship, to fill the emptiness that we have inside. Does anybody know what I'm talking about so far? If so, say amen. amen. So, so this, is, this is where this guy is. Now, this is very likely that's exactly where I think Jacob is. So here's the passage. It says, now Laban, which is his uncle, had two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. Say that with me. Weak eyes. But Rachel had a lovely figure, and was beautiful. Now, most Hebrew scholars believe that the fact that it says Leah had weak eyes, that it is a very nice way of saying she is not attractive, okay? Now, 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 now most, I, I, I'm just, they think it might really be saying she's hard on the eyes. You know what I'm saying, really? That, 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 what's going on here? And, and here's why. Because it said Leah had weak eyes, but it don't say, but now Rachel had 20-20 vision. Okay, it don't, it don't say anything like that. It says Leah had weak eyes, and then it don't say anything about Rachel's eyes. It says, but now Rachel, she had curves that won't stop. You know, right? She was a hottie with a body, right? She, was a, she had a lovely figure, and, and she was beautiful. So, so most believe that what they're doing is they're contrasting the beauty, and Leah was, was not as attractive as Rachel. Now, I decided to do a, you know, a word study in Hebrew and really search and reconstruct what Leah must have looked like based on the words that were used, and we can know, and, and here's exactly what she looked like right here. This is, this is a picture of Leah. <laughs> Do you notice how weak her eyes look? <laughs> Do you see? Do you see how weak those eyes are looking these days? I mean, this is Leah, and, and so then I took the same words, and I reconstructed what Rachel must have looked like based on the words, and this is exactly what she looked like. Now, you say, well, Dad, that looks a lot like your wife, Melissa. You're absolutely right. This is my smoking hot wife, Melissa, and I just got brownie ports, and I will redeem them as soon as I can, just so you're aware. <laughs> so th this, is, this is what it is. Now, I decided to let you hear a little bit of commentary on, uh, on um, what Rachel and Leah must have looked like and what Leah must have looked like. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Aunt Boo. She's somebody around Raleigh. But Aunt Boo gives some commentary. I just thought I'd let you hear her commentary on what Leah must have looked like. Y'all know what? I don't know why people be bothering me, but, you know, people do. They find time in their busy schedules just to bother me. But I, I want to let you know something here, you know. You should not debate me on some things uh, because especially, you know, when your, your concept is not even Bible. Okay, so let me tell you what happened. Somebody said that everything God made was beautiful, so there are no such thing as, uh, no such thing as an ugly person. All I got is a Bible to give you, and that's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the Bible. Genesis 1 and 31. It said, God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Period. It didn't, didn't say continue on the next page where it started talking about everything was beautiful. No. It said everything was very good. It, 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 and, and the end is there, right, right there. You know. Then Genesis, the 29th chapter. Now, we're still in the first book of the Bible. You know that, right? 16, it says, And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Verse 17 says this, Leah was tender-eyed, 
but Rachel was beautiful and well favored. Let me say that again. Leah was tender eyed, tender eyed. That means she was toe up from the floor up. Girl was hurt. I'm talking about from the crown down. She was ugly. If not, it wouldn't have said, but Rachel was beautiful and well favored. That but in there sort of kind of let you know that they about to discuss the opposite of the tender eye. You see what I'm saying? Some people just born ugly. Some people are born ugly and end up growing out of ugly. Some people are born ugly and they stay ugly until death. And some people start out looking good and then they end up ugly because of the life they chose to live. God, he's the creator of us all, but everybody ain't pretty. So if you bring me an ugly baby, my Lord, and I'm talking about that baby look like a, 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 a baby orangutan, and I just say, woo, my, look at him. Boy, you got yourself a boy. I'm being nice, because really, on the inside, I'm like, dang. Listen, some people, when they come together, it's just genetically impossible for them to have a beautiful child, unless the Lord, of course, get in them jeans, swash something around, and perform a miracle. Now, I done told you my personal, personal opinion, and I gave you the word. Don't debate me no more. I'm done. I am, I am done. Everybody in this world ain't pretty. But God is the creator of all. He loves us all. And all can be saved. Both the pretty and the ugly. That's good preaching right there, ain't it? That's good. Because y'all know y'all think it. And, uh, here you go. Ready? The, the, the serious part of this, and I don't ever want to undervalue physical appearance, okay? God gave us the ability to be attracted, attracted to people, and you should always uh, take care of your physical appearance and put some thought into that and make sure you're attracted to your spouse and that. But listen, in our world, come on, so I'll say, man, this is true, we overvalue the external. And we put way too much stock on the external. And what do they look like? Do they have a car? What kind of money do they have? How successful are they? What does it look? And listen, I'm telling you, uh, again, don't, uh, physical attraction is important, but don't overvalue that because what we're going to learn from this story is that Leah was actually the person, far better person of character than Rachel, even though Rachel had the, the and it heavily, strongly implies that, even though Rachel had the physical appearance. Do not get hungry hung up on that. Some all, all the single people, you listen, don't get hung up on that. I'm going to tell you, like one of my mentors told me whenever I was in Bible college, he said, listen, you need to be attracted to a girl, but don't marry a figure because a figure will change on you. I'm amazed at the power of gravity every time I look at myself in the mirror. Somebody, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I'm telling you, a figure will change on you. You got you to gotta, you gotta marry for something other than that, some substance that is there. So Jacob is looking at this girl. He says, she is smoking hot. My life is empty. My, I, don't have, I got a void, and I got to marry her. And, and, so, and, and see, that's where a lot of people are. That's where some of you are. You're disillusioned, and you're thinking marriage is going to be the answer for my life. Marriage is going to be the key to make me happy. And whenever that happens, there's three things that are going to happen in your life. I want you to take notes. Whenever you start thinking, some of you single, folks there and some of you married folks where you start thinking marriage is the key that's going to provide my happiness. My happiness is resting in the fact of who I'm marrying. Three things will happen in your marriage that are toxic and that will begin to kill your marriage. Everybody ready? If you're ready, say yes. yes. Here we go. Number one, believing that marriage is the answer for your happiness leads to number one, unhealthy compromise where you'll begin to give up things that you shouldn't give up in the pursuit of the one who will satisfy you. So Jacob decides he's got to marry Rachel, and so he goes to make a deal with good old Uncle Laban. And here's what he said. Jacob was in love with Rachel. Now let me just pause there for a second before I read the rest of that verse. Most scholars believe that it says he was in love with Rachel, but at best this was love at first sight, and most likely it is more of an infatuation than it was love at first sight. And, and there's lots of reasons for that. Is because Jacob barely knew this woman. He, he, he was not near uh, 
He was not where he needed to be with God. There's no evidence that he prayed. Whenever his dad's servant went to look for a wife for him in that same region, he prayed. There's nothing in the story about any of that. He's fleeing. He just sees this girl, and he says, I got to marry her. And it kind of lends that probably that love was a little weak because of what happens later in their relationship and their thing. It's, it, it, it gets a little toxic at times as you read through their story because obviously there was just it was, it was a little bit superficial and shallow at this stage. So don't, don't glamorize it too much whenever we go through. Jacob was in love with Rachel. Uh, Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you. He's talking to Uncle Laban. Seven years I marry my cousin <laughs> in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Now, some of you ladies may be offended by that. and You're like, wait a minute, what is that about? Well, that's the way it worked. In that culture, you would purchase your bride with either money, uh, livestock, or time where you would work. And, and this was the dynamic that had to happen uh, for you to get a wife. Now, typically, the way it would work in that culture is you would negotiate with the father-in-law about getting what it would require to get this lady, his daughter, as your wife. And, and I'm telling you, I think that's probably not a bad thing because I would love to negotiate with the little idiot that wants my daughter one day. You know what I'm saying, right? Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. But anyway, this is the negotiation that has to happen. Now, typically the father is going to want more because he's going to lose a farmhand, a househand, whatever she did. He's going to lose a very, very valuable asset to their economy and economic system. And the guy, he's burning up. He wants to have her right now. So he's going to try to negotiate with a lower time frame or whatever, because his whole deal, he wants to get her sooner. Now, in this story, there don't seem to be any negotiation. What happens is immediately Jacob says, I will work for her how many years? Seven years. Now, Pastor Craig Rochelle, who we're, again, basing these sermons on, he says that is twice as long, uh, excuse me, that is about four times as long as the normal amount of time that a man would work for getting the wife. Now, I don't know if that's 100% true or not, but what I do know, and you say, some of you is like, oh, that's so romantic, he'll work twice as long. Well, maybe it is, and, and, and the Bible says that Jacob didn't mind it. It says that he felt like it was just a few days, you know, which makes me like, I, I don't understand that whole thing because when Melissa and I got together, she lived three hours away. I didn't think marriage would ever come. Y'all know what I'm saying, right? I mean, I, was, I didn't think it would ever happen. I mean, it didn't seem like two or three days to me, so I don't understand that whole logic and where he's at. It doesn't make sense to me, but nevertheless, he didn't seem to mind the time, but obviously the time seems to be a, a lot longer, and most things think it is. In fact, some would say it's insane. <laughs> it's just insane because why would he want to work that long for a girl that he had, that, that he's in love with? Why, why would he want to give that much of himself? And, and notice that Laban's like, uh, he, well, you don't, you don't have this here, but he's going to be like, okay, that's fine. Now, Laban didn't even counter offer because evidently most scholars believe it was a very generous offer. So Laban didn't even have to counterbalance. He didn't have to negotiate. There was nothing else to negotiate because this was such a generous offer. So here's what, here's what appears to be going on is Jacob appears to be going on and saying, I want this woman and I will do anything to get her. I want to be married, and I will do anything to be married. I will compromise myself in any way to be married because she's beautiful. Now, you may disagree with the take on this whole passage in this seven years, and that's okay because I told you we're going we're gonna to kind of read in there, but I'm telling you what a lot of commentaries believe and what it is, and I tend to go along with that. But here's what I think most of us can agree on, even if you disagree with the motive there is that we see this a lot in our culture. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Where people just feel like marriage is going to be the answer and they compromise themselves unduly for it. For it you, you, you all know the sweet girl who says, I'm going to save myself to marriage and I'm not going to have sex before marriage. And then she gets with the guy who begins to push her sexually. And so she reasons in her mind, maybe if I give him my body, he'll give me his heart. Compromise. Just, just compromise. Or, or, the, or the, the girl who's dating a guy who is an absolute jerk. I mean, don't look at him, but I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? Who's an absolute jerk. He treats her bad. He just constantly treats her bad. And, 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 but she's like, I'm 30 years old. My closet is full of them ugly bridesmaid dresses that I'm never going to wear. I'll donate them to special needs prom or something, you know, right? 
And I'm, I mean, I'm tired of being the bridesmaid and never the bride. And I'm 30 years old. I want to have kids one day. My biological clock's ticking. Maybe, maybe if I marry him, he will be less of a jerk after we get married. She compromises. Or the Christian girl who uh, is staying with the guy and he's like, hey, we need to go to the next level. I'm tired of first base. You know, we need to go all the way to home. And she says, well, you need to go to church with me. And he goes to church. And so she reasons in her mind, he's, he's, he's compromising. So I need to compromise. And neither one of them means anything. Him coming to church don't mean anything. And her giving herself to him don't mean anything because it's based on a lie. It's a compromise. Or the guy who's dating the really shallow, rather shallow girl who likes material things, and that's very important to her and image, and so he decides to go in debt and get himself in debt to get things that would impress her uh, just so that he could keep her. He's, he's just a compromise. It's just a compromise. Now, we've, we've probably all seen this. When, when you think marriage is the answer, that marriage is going to make you happy, then you will begin to compromise pieces of yourself that you should not compromise in order to get this marriage. Have y'all seen it? If so, say amen. amen. Have you seen it blow up on somebody's face? If so, say oh my. <laughs> Number two, believing marriage is the answer leads to unhealthy compromise. But the second thing it leads to is contractual demands. Okay? Now, where it turns into a contract where you begin to see marriage as a contract and you demand this is what is going to happen. If I give this, then you give that. And it becomes, and then you start demanding to receive the things that you feel like you are due because they've got to hold up their end of the contract. That's exactly what happened to Jacob. He had worked seven years. And so here's where we pick up the story. Then Jacob, after amazingly, he made it through the seven years. I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm not sure I would have, but he made it through the seven years. Then Jacob said to Laban, Uncle Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. <laughs> Can I just say to any young man wanting to ask, a father for his daughter's hand. <laughs> this is not what you say. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> and if you read it in the King James, it is vulgar. You can't even say it in church, Harley, the way he says it. Uh, he's saying, basically, I did my part, uncle. <laughs> now send her over here because it's time for her to do her part. I, 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 it sounds a little shallow. Not so romantic. And according to, I don't know much about Hebrew at all, but Pastor Craig Groeschel, who, again, he says that the, the wording of this a Hebrew is actually um, derogatory, is very dishonoring to the girl and to the father. It's not very polite at all. And the word, basically, he's saying, give her to me. I did my part. Now, she's got to come over here and do her part. Now, honestly, honestly, I, I'm going to have to tell you the truth. I've seen this happen in a lot of marriages where all of a sudden you get into the marriage and instead of the marriage being a covenant the way God intended for it to be, where I will lay down my life for my spouse, it now becomes a contract. You do this and I do this, but if you don't do this, then I'm going to withhold certain things from you and you're going, you know, and, and it becomes, and, and it becomes this little back and forth thing over so many different areas. And, and as soon as that happens, let me just tell you what's going to happen. you when it becomes a contract, your expectations of your spouse, your husband or your wife, they will rise and immediately they're going to let you down. They're going to disappoint you. I mean, I'm telling you, when you have that level of expectation for your spouse, and some of you are there right now, you are so disappointed in your spouse. You're so dissatisfied in your marriage, and it's possibly because you gone at it from a contract. I give this, then you must give this, and whatever. And, and because of that, now you're dissatisfied in that marriage, and the reason is because you lost the whole covenant relationship, and now it's become a contract. Well, And, and, and this is what's going on. So let me just kind of give some examples at risk of getting myself in trouble. Maybe you are married to a very demanding wife who says, I have to live in this house, in this neighborhood, and I have to keep up with these people, and I got, and you're supposed to be making a living. What kind of man are you? You ought to be making a living for us, and you're not providing, and da 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 da, da and you've got food, you got, and you got a house, but yeah, you're not up to her friends and her social. It's constantly demanding, and 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 you know, he says, you don't make biscuits like my mama, and she says, because you don't bring home the dough like my daddy, you know, right? And it's just, 
I mean, it's going back and forth, back and forth. Or maybe you're married to a wife that's very nitpicky. I mean, every little thing, it's all got to be perfect. And quite honestly, she just nags. Don't, do not throw elbows. You better sit still and be like, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. You know what I mean? You better. You see, here's the thing, ladies. A lot of times, ladies have, very, have, have expectations that are, non, that are uncommunicated. Now, let me just tell you something about men. If you don't tell us, we don't know. And if you tell us and say it slow, we still may not know. You understand, okay? You say, well, you sound like y'all are dumb. We lick paint chips growing up, most likely, okay? I'm just being honest. All right, so, so, so this, is, this is there. But it works both ways. I mean, it works both ways. And some of you ladies, you're married to a man, and you are, you're, you're working. You got a job. He's got a job. But yet when he comes home, he feels like he can sit down and be like, what's for dinner? Why ain't you cooked? And why ain't the laundry done? I mean, he's just very demanding. Just very demanding. Or, or worse, you're a stay-at-home mom, and he comes home, and he's like, must be nice not having a job. and <laughs> Don't do nothing all day. And you've been chasing his bratty youngin' because you didn't know he was gonna, that youngin' was going to act like him, right? And now you're, worn out, you're about ready to kill him, and he's like, ain't it nice not having a job? I want you to run me bath and feed me grapes, you know, right? you know whatever. And, and you're just wanting to, like, punch him in his throat in the name of Jesus, you know? <laughs> now, 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 here's the deal. Here's what I've noticed happens. Whenever you get into this contractual relationship, it turns into manipulation. And you start looking for things in the marriage to give leverage. Let me tell you where it mostly, let me just you know, go ahead and head it off. This is what I've noticed after 20-some years of working with couples. Typically, this is not 100% true, so I'm stereotyping here. Typically, the man will make more money in the household. And, so, and, and, and he will say, if you don't do this, then you can forget it. I'm cutting you off financially. And he uses money to be a manipulation. And ladies tend to use sex. If you don't do this, then I'm cutting you off. And, and what it turns out to is a manipulation, a very contractual deal, and both of you are dissatisfied and disappointed. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you and um, just go ahead and tell you that it is extremely, extremely easy to do, even in the best, most healthy marriages. Uh, I find myself at times even like, you know, I don't think she knows who she's married to. This is Dale Sauls. I have provided. You know how many women would want me? <laughs> That's what she did. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> uh, none, you know, right? But see, what happens is you get yourself in that game, and y'all know what I'm talking about. Say, hey, man, if you do, right? Where you play games, and you're like, I'm going to go see how many days it goes without even kissing her, see if she even notices, or how many days it goes where he gave me that. Y'all play these games because it's turned into a contract. And I guarantee you somebody's going to be disappointed. Somebody say amen if I'm preaching all right. Does this make sense? Whenever you start going into a marriage thinking that this is going to be the answer, it leads to unhealthy compromise. It leads to contractual demands. And in third, it's going to lead to dissatisfaction slash disappointment. I couldn't decide which word to put there, so I put both of them. You pick the one you like or put both of them. It, it, it's going to lead to dissatisfaction or disappointment. Now, some some. I enter the marriage with so many, we all of us enter the marriage with so many expectations that there's no way the person that we're marrying could fulfill them. And in fact, whenever some of you right now are single and you're wanting to get married and you're dreaming, he's going to be this and he's going to be that and he's going to love, he's going to love, you know, shopping and he's going to love rubbing my feet and he's going to love, listen, let me tell you what happened. You are setting him up for failure. Amen. It's guaranteed off the bar. I mean, just right off the bat, it's going to fail. He's going to fail. It's guaranteed failure. So let's get back to our story. Now, let me catch you up. Here's what's going on. Let me, uh, Jacob goes to his uncle Abram and says, I got to marry this girl. I got to marry this girl. I'll give you seven years. I know that's more than normal, but I mean, I just want her that bad. Just go ahead. You know, I know she's the young one, but just give me, give her to me. I work seven years. Then he works the seven years. And then he goes to uncle Abram and says, okay, I, I'm ready to get married. Now, uncle Laban says, I got a problem because I got uh, typically in our culture, we'd have married an older girl off first, but she's got them tender eyes, you know, right? <laughs> she got them weak eyes. And so I ain't sure how that's going to go because she's unattractive and I ain't sure I can get her married off. And, and, and now he's wanting, he's wanting Rachel, but I can't very well do that. So he, he comes up with his plan. Now, in order to understand his plan, you got to understand the wedding feast that is going on here during this time, the wedding feast would last about seven days, okay? So, so they got about seven days of partying going on for the wedding. Now, in this culture, when you got seven days of partying, there is a high likelihood 
somebody's going to get inebriated. You understand, right? And so probably after about seven days, here it is, and it ends with them going into the marriage chamber and consummating this marriage. And, and, and we don't know this. Now, I'm, again, I'm reading between the lines. It may not have been like this, but there is a possibility that at this stage, old Jacob is toasted, okay? He's not, he's not really walking with the Lord. He's been waiting seven years for this. He's probably partying good. But even if he won't, they didn't have security lights and electricity and all this stuff that they have now. And, and so there was some you know, some, some darkness and things that are there. They got all that stuff going on. So Uncle Laban designs this plan. And I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. This is crazy. Here's what he does. Uncle Laban takes this big veil and this big dress and puts it on his tender-eyed daughter. This, this weak-eyed girl. And he says, now here's what we're going to do, all right? He, we're going to go in there. You go ahead and put this on. You go on into the marriage chamber and do the deed, you know, seal the deal, get this thing done. And then when you come out because of the culture, then you're going to be married. And then we got this thing solved. You're going to be married. You can't make this junk up. You understand, right? I mean, this is Jerry Springer stuff. This is crazy. So this is exactly what happened. But, but when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and Jacob made love to her. When morning came, there was Leah. <laughs> I tell you, I love it. Y'all to read the Bible. There's some good stuff in the Bible, you know? So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel. Seven years, might I add. I added that part, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Now, he was a trickster. He deceived him. So most commentators believe he deceived him because it reaped what he had sown. He deceived his brothers and things. And so now he's reaping what he sown. But here's the point that I want to make with you is that disappointment is going to follow a marriage whenever you think somebody is going to meet your needs and all your needs will make you happy. Whenever you go into a marriage thinking they are going to meet all your needs, you are going to be disappointed. I'm just telling you like it is. Would you believe that marriage is going to be your answer for happiness in life? Some of you single people, y'all think y'all can't be happy till you get married. Let me tell you what's going to happen. When you think you need another person to make you happy, you will go to bed thinking you're with Rachel, but you'll wake up with Leah every time. You'll wake up with a disappointment every time. And some of you have done that. Some of you have a night out, nightstand, and... You thought another relationship and going from this person, you left your spouse or whatever, and you woke up when, when the lights came on in your mind, wow, you still as unhappy, if not more so. Th this, is exactly, this is exactly what happened. Now, what's interesting to me, though, is that really Leah is doing the same thing. Now, um, either she's an incredibly obedient daughter, and I don't know, maybe she didn't have a choice. I don't know. But she goes into this thing, and we'll find out from other story. She goes into this thing knowing. She, she says to herself, I'm the older one. He's stable. He's obviously got a work ethic. He worked for seven years. And I'm going to go into this thing. Maybe if I give him my body, he'll love me. And she went to the bedroom with a man that did not love her. Um, incredibly, incredibly sad, but it mirrors so many people's story, even in this room that are watching online and at Life Springs and wherever, in the lounge or whatever. You, you, you know that too. Now, Throughout the marriage, she's constantly, because now she's in this marriage and she's now done this, she's trying to find a way to make him love her. And it's, it's a really sad story. It just gets from worse to worse. And she's just trying to make him love her, trying to make him love her. She's doing everything she can to make, maybe if I do this, he'll love me. Genesis 29 says, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For he, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Now this is, listen to this line. Surely my husband will love me now. I personally believe that's one of the saddest lines in scripture. That breaks my heart and makes me want to cry every time I read that sentence. Maybe if I can give him children... This marriage is going to work. Maybe if I can make more money, she'll stay with me, and this marriage will work, and I can make her happy. Maybe if I go ahead and have the surgery, 
and give him what he wants, he'll find me attractive. Maybe, maybe if I can create this lifestyle for her or him and run with this certain crowd, they'll find me not a drag and want to be with me. But he didn't love her. He didn't love her before, and he didn't love her after the kids. Now, um, let me ask you, from this story, what's missing? Let me answer it. I see nothing in this story to this point where anybody is seeking God at all. Nobody's praying. Nobody's seeking God. There is no sense of, wow, me and Rachel have this spiritual connection. We both are on the same page. She loves God. I love God. We've both got this faith thing going on. There, there's nothing in the story that, at this point to make us think there's that kind of connection. They were searching for the one, and they were going. He went to this town looking for the one, just like you're. Some of you single. Some of you not single. You're looking for the one to meet your needs, and you're looking for the one to make sure. And the problem is they're searching for the wrong one because, see, We've been taught by culture that whatever you go find, that, that there's one person out here, and you need to go find that one person who's going to make you happy, your soulmate. Every movie says that, and when you find them, it's going to be Mr. Right, Mrs. Right, and, and so you're constantly searching. You're going to the food line. Maybe that's the one. Maybe that's the one. Maybe that's the one. Maybe that's the one. He's cute. Maybe that's the one. She's got a great personality. That's the one. Nope, not her. Nope, not, not her. No, her. That's her. Nope, that's not her. No, that's her. And you're constantly going through life looking for the one, looking for the one, looking for the one. How's that working out for you, by the way? And it's just dumb, okay? I mean, if you think about it, it's just dumb. Like, let's just say I'm supposed to marry whoever, Susie, all right? And I don't marry Susie, but I marry Melissa. And Melissa was supposed to marry, marry a David. And David was supposed to marry Melissa, but he didn't marry Melissa because I stole Melissa. And so now David's got to marry Jane. And because now, because Jane is there, then now, now she was supposed to marry Bob. And because, and it's like, now because I met, and let me just tell you, if it was only one person, somebody would have messed it up a long time ago. You know what I'm saying, right? It don't even make common sense, but yet that's the way we think. There's just one thing, and it's going to be there, and it makes good movies and good songs, and that one person's going to come into our life, and it's going to make us all happy. And, and, and see, to, to really be fulfilled in life, you, you do have to meet the one, but here's what I want to tell you. The one you need to meet is not another person. It's the one, God. And when you meet your wife or your husband, you've met your number two. And as long as you keep looking for the one, you're going to keep coming up short and dry every time. You're going to have to go for the one and let your spouse be number two. So here, here, here's what goes into the blank. Healthy marriages grow from both of you finding the one Jesus. And if both of you don't find the one Jesus, you're going to keep on literally sucking the life out of your marriage because you keep trying to get happiness from, your, uh, from the other person and you cannot get happiness from another person. You're going to have to find that in Jesus Christ alone. Now that person can compliment you. That person can create a rich life. And I don't mean to devalue love, but I'm just trying to be straight up. When you go to in, into the marriage and your happiness depends on that person and that marriage, it is a setup for failure. Can any married people say amen to what I'm preaching? Amen. Now, now this is, this, Jesus said, he, and, and you say this is exactly what he said. He said the same thing. He said there's one big commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The one. And the second one, he said if you want everything to work good in your life, then here's what you do. Seek ye first the one and all his righteousness, and then all these other things you're worried about will be added unto you. This is over and over and over and over in Scripture. Now, to really have the kind of marriage God wants you to have is you're going to have to both seek the one. And the reason some of you right now are so dissatisfied in your marriage is because you've not been seeking the one. You've been trying to wring out of your relationship all the meaning and happiness of your life, and it's not going to work. And God brought me here for me to tell you, brought you here for me to tell you, you need to give your life wholeheartedly, both of you, and get your fulfillment and happiness from Jesus. Um, that's why whenever in our church, we don't just do ceremonies. We do premarital counseling and help people. Here's what we tell them. We help them set up godly homes. We don't just do marriage ceremonies. That's the reason why. It's because I know their marriage will fail. 
otherwise. So this story gets bizarre, and we're going to end it by focusing on Leah and what happened. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simon. Again, she conceived, and when she... When she gave birth to a son, she said, Now, at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi, and each time she's not getting love. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. There's the difference. This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Now notice the difference. You see the difference? This time she what? She praised the Lord. You see, this time something's different about this one. This time I'm, I'm turning to God. And you know what's amazing about this whole thing? Is the fact this son that she turned to God's name was Judah. And let me tell you what's so amazing about that. You say, why is that a big deal? Because Judah was born to Leah, the unattractive the one, the one with the weak eyes. It, he was not born to Rachel. Now, why is that important? Because later Judah... From his line would come the Savior of the world, Jesus, from Leah. Now, let me tell you why that's important. Because the Bible proved, once again, we just finished a series called Epic Fails, and we proved it over and over again. The Bible proved, once again, listen to me, this is, this is the word of the Lord. The Bible proved, once again, that something that starts wrong and is ugly, God can bring beauty out of it. God can bring a miracle out of something that is wrong right now. God is an awesome God. And the Bible says he has an ability to bring beauty from ashes. And so some of you right now, you're in a marriage that did not start out right. In fact, it's not right right now. Real time, you're sitting right here in whatever auditorium you're in. And it's not right at this moment, right now. It's dysfunctional. But here's the great news. We serve a God that can bring beauty from something that's not been pretty up to this point. No matter how it started, we got a redemptive God. You say, well, Dale, where do I start? Let me tell you where to start right now. Is you reach over right now and grab the hand of your spouse, of your boyfriend, of your girlfriend. Maybe y'all have gotten off track. And you say, just grab her hand, grab his hand right now. And you pray a prayer. Maybe you've never prayed a prayer. You don't know how to pray a prayer. You've never been taught how to pray a prayer. Y'all have never prayed together. But you just say this right now. Say, we're going to start chasing the one. We're going to start giving our life to the one to get this marriage back on a right road. And there's no telling. There's no telling what good things God can bring out of your marriage if you'll do that. How many of you understand this message? Hold your hands up. Good night. I'd like for you to bow your head and close your eyes and those at Life Springs and those in the lounge right now I want everybody to do that and just close your eyes and bow your head and I want you to think about what I'm saying right here I want you to think about what's happening inside of this room there's some of you right now that are single and you just feel like you can't be happy until you get married. And you're just constantly doing that. And right now, would you just raise your hand right now if you say, Dale, I'm single and I'm so lonely. I'm about to die, I feel like. And I'm dying inside and I've been dying to get married. Just hold your hands up good and high right now. I, I see your hands. And that's okay. It's okay. I've been there. I've been there. I, I, I know exactly what that's like right now. With hands raised, God, for every single person right now, would you just make a commitment and say, God, I'm not going to look at another person to make me happy. I want to get married. I want you to send me somebody, but I'm not going to compromise myself. I'm not going to compromise my values. I'm not going to go into this expectation that they're going to make me happy. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to seek the one. And I'm asking you, yours is seek you first, the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be added unto you. I'm asking you to add it to me, but I'm going to seek you first right now. You can put your hands down. I want to talk to another group of people right now. Maybe you're here or maybe you're watching online or maybe you're at Life Springs or in the lounge right now and, and you're in a marriage that honestly has kind of become a contract. And you guys are just not happy. You're kind of dissatisfied. And, and the reason is because you, realize, you recognize through this story, 
you can't approach it like a contract, just hold your hands up good and high. Just if you can do that. Here, couples, just hold your hands up right now. Anybody, I see hands. I, I see hands right now. Father, for every hand raised, and I know it's tough to raise your hand right now, beat them with them. Meet them right where they are right now, God. And let them say, you know what? We're going to seek the one. We're not going to no longer try to wring out of this relationship fulfillment and joy. We're done with that. We're done with that. We're going to seek the one. In the name of Jesus. You, you can put your hands down right now. Let me talk to another one. How about some of you who hook in with Jacob? Where there's an emptiness in your soul because maybe of the father wound or some relationships and it's just been empty inside you just raise your hand right now. I want to pray with you. You're just, you're seeking something, seeking happiness. I see your hands. Yeah. Anybody else? Just keep your hand up right now. Just Father, for every person that's raising their hand right now, right now, God, just meet them where they are and feel their emptiness. Feel that void with your spirit. Let them seek the one right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You, you can put your hands down. One more group right here. Maybe you don't know if you're really a Christian. You've never really invited God into your life. You're not sure where you would go if you were to die right now and you, you realize you need to sell out to the one. Would you hold your hands up good and high right now if that's you? If that's you. Yeah, see, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Let's keep your hand up. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, these folks have got courage to raise their hand. They've had courage to raise their hand. Just say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Come into my heart and life. Forgive me. And from this point forward, I want to do life with you. If you're praying that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the kingdom of God. You're just as much a Christian as I am. Right now, in your auditorium, hopefully, at Life Springs in the Lounge, there's somebody that is there right now with a basket of stained glass. And there's people right here. Every time anybody gets saved, we take and give them a piece of stained glass to symbolic of the commitment they make. And we put a stained glass. We've been putting stained glass on this cross to be symbolic of it. But we got a new symbol I'm going to tell you about in a few weeks. But you come get your piece of stained glass and keep it as a symbol of your commitment. I'm going to release those right now at Life Springs for you to end your service. I love you guys and you engage with God right now.